Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LCK semifinals overview and analysis video in the summer split playoffs. We are down to three teams. We know Genji is awaiting in the finals, but today we get to determine who is going to meet them in said finals because we get our semifinals matchup, our lower bracket finals, whatever you want to classify it as. A very important series, obviously, because making finals is a big deal, but also because this guarantees a spot at Worlds if you are able to win this series. It means you don't have to go through the regional qualifier. It means you're guaranteed a top two seed, which is really important for both of these teams. So very excited to see which one comes out on top. If you want to know my thoughts on the playoffs leading into this, check out the videos up in the iCard. Of course, up there is going to be uh, the previous videos on the playoffs, as well as the LCK playlist, which is going to have every single game from the regular season in the summer split done in a very similar format to this. And obviously, if you want to know my thoughts on everything leading in here, that is a great place to start, but it's obviously not required of viewing. We're going to be going over everything you need to know for today's video at the beginning. But if you want some context, as to maybe why I feel certain ways about certain players. That is a great place to start, but I don't want to waste you guys' time too much at the beginning of the video. Let's get right into the content. If you are new here, what we are going to do is go game by game in the semifinals, talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I'll be giving a player of the game and a dud of the game for each individual game that we cover, and of course, at the end of the series, I will be giving a player of the series to tie everything into a nice, neat little bow. We will very quickly be previewing the finals at the end of this video, but we talked about these teams so much over the course of this year. I think you guys have a pretty good idea of what I'm feeling when it comes to the finals and when it comes to my predictions, regardless of who ends up winning this series. We will definitely touch upon it, but most of today will be spent talking about the semifinals here and then quickly touching upon the regional qualifiers as well now that we have that locked in. But Without further ado, let's jump right into the analysis of these games. It is a really, really fun matchup, the one we were all hoping to see here in the semifinals because it could go a variety of different ways. It's the number two seeded Hanwha Life Esports taking on the number four seeded T1. And the reason this is so exciting is because it's probably the clear second best team in the LCK in terms of performance so far over the course of the summer split in HLE taking on the kings of the LCK that always seem to level up when it matters the most in T1. This is a rematch of not only round two in the previous uh, playoff series. Uh, you know, obviously these two teams have already played this playoffs with HLE taking a dominant 3-0 sweep uh, from that series. But also this is a rematch from the semifinals last split from top three where HLE was looking really good. They were looking really strong up until they ran into T1 who just outplayed them in the semifinals. They got their T1 playoff buff and they went on to win that series and make finals and even push Gen G in those finals finals. The concern is that T1 probably isn't the team that they were going into that semifinals. I think they're playing worse right now than they did in the spring split, and honestly, HLE is significantly better. I talked about this a bit at the end of the previous video, the round number three video, but there is actually a lot to like about what HLE is doing right now. I know some people are put off by them kind of getting destroyed by Genji in the winner's finals, but they still were able to take a game, and I think generally speaking, no one's expecting this team to be better than Genji. They're just expecting them to be better than T1, and I think that that's very reasonable. HLE's winning percentage against T1 over the course of this year is actually really good. I think a lot of people are going to look back at that, you know, semifinals loss and be like, ah, well, there are some reasons to be concerned, but obviously they've now beaten them in two of the three playoff series they've played against them. They've beaten them in three of the four regular season series that they've played against them. HLE has honestly kind of had T1's number over the course of this year, and also a couple of these players are pretty infamous for beating T1. Players like Doran, players like Del Light, even someone like Zeka, like these are players that have kind of made a reputation of beating T1 even when they're not necessarily on teams that you would expect to be better. Zeka obviously doing it in World Finals, Doran has like a historically good record against T1, Peanut honestly is a really good record against T1, Delight has had a really good record against T1 ever since coming up out of bro and onto actually good teams, like there is a lot of reason to be excited about HLE in a series like this, but on the flip side, if you're not thinking with your brain and you're thinking with your heart, like T1 always levels up when it matters the most. This is a team that basically always steps up to the challenge, and even if they've been struggling in years past, with they, which they absolutely have, they were arguably just as bad coming into the playoffs last year in summer, and they went on to finals. They went on to do just fine as I think like the number five seed at 500 or whatever when Faker wasn't playing for a majority of the summer split. Even in those circumstances, they were able to come into the playoffs, figure things out, overcome a lot of challenges, 
challenges and make top two. It just feels like it's impossible for this team to get anything worse than top two with this iteration of the roster. And if you're thinking with your heart like that, then I can understand why you would consider T1 to be favorites in a series like this. You have to imagine that players like Zeus and Faker and Owner that maybe haven't been all that great over the course of this split, haven't been playing up to their career norms. You have to imagine that they are going to lock in and play some of their best League of Legends in a series like this. Kuma and Kerry have already been pretty good over the course of this split. Maybe not so much in the playoffs. They, were, they weren't really all that much of a determining factor against D plus Kia, but... You know, I expect this bot lane to be generally fine in terms of the 2v2, but if you get really good performances out of the top side of the map, then yeah, T1 can win this series. But I have to think with my head. I have to predict with my head. As I said at the end of my round three video, I have to see HLE lose to T1 before I just believe that that's what they're going to do. They have looked better than T1 at every step of the way leading into this series, and there's really no reason to believe that the team that just swept them out of winner's bracket, upper bracket, is just going to suddenly like fall apart and lose to them. They're going to be heavy favorites coming into this series for a reason, but if you can get to players like Peanut and Zekka, who can be rather flippy, even someone like Doran in the top lane, then I think that that's a really good start. Zeus already showed that if he can get a gigantic lead on his enemy top laner like he did against DK, that he can really take over a series. And if Faker is doing the same thing in the mid lane, this could be a problem for HLE. So there are avenues for T1 to get into this, but HLE is definitely more clinical in terms of their execution, and that's why I'm predicting them to be favorites. Of course, if T1 wins, no one's going to be really shocked, but... The only way to know how this series actually does end up turning out is to go game by game, and that means starting with game number one. So let's get right into it. The winner of game number one was... Hanwha Life Esports. They are going to take game number one of this series. They're going to go up one to nothing. And this is already such a great start for them. This is everything they wanted to see out of the first game. You know, there was some back and forth, I would say, early on. But generally speaking, T1 clearly just drafted a comp that they didn't feel particularly comfortable playing. I don't think, conceptually, this is a horrible draft from T1. It just didn't feel like they were in their comfort zone. And HLE very much was. They had a lot of their signature picks in this game. Things like uh, Jack's Top, even something like a Smolder Mid, I think really plays into the playstyle of Zekka. But none more so, obviously, than Poppy in the jungle. Peanut is a very, very easy choice for player of the game in game one. He is essentially the, like, popularizer of uh, Poppy Jungle. When you think back the last two years, the first person to start playing Poppy Jungle in pro was Peanut anywhere in the world on Gen G. He was really somebody who showed the power of this pick that you are able to clear relatively quickly, that you have so much gank assist, that you're very useful in the later half of the game. Your objective control is really good. Like, Peanut is the Poppy Jungle guy, and so uh, this is the champion I probably most associate with him at this point in time, and he is is the best poppy jungle in the world. Ever since then, nobody's really been able to touch his ability to play this champion either. He just has such a mastery over where and when to utilize her skill set, and Poppy is one of the most universally useful characters and champions in the entire game. There is almost no situation in modern League of Legends where Poppy is not going to be useful because she is so good at countering a lot of the new tools that they keep coming out with for a lot of these champions, countering dashes, countering a lot of the high mobility champions, and just generally being able to force, like, 5v5s that turn into 4v5s because of her ultimate. Hell, even 3v5s at times if you're really good at her ult. You know, I mean, there's like a lot of tools that Poppy just generally has that other champs just don't give you access to, and Peanut has such a mastery over those, and that's adding on to the idea that he is genuinely just one of the smartest players in the entire world in terms of his pathing and in terms of his decision making in the mid game. It really creates this situation where if you get anyone on his team gold when he has Poppy, he is going to make your life absolutely miserable, and that includes things like Jin, that includes things like Jax. He knows how to punish a lot of the mistakes, even if you don't get a lot of the gold onto the hyper carry, which they did this game. Zekka was still very fed on the smolder. They didn't really have a good answer to that, but Peanut was the creator. He was the one to dominate this game, and I don't think anyone's really going to be arguing that he deserved player of the game. This was a spectacular, phenomenal performance from him, and if he's going to be able to do this consistently, it's not going to be a very easy series for T1 to win. But of course, Zekka and Viper deserve a lot of shoutouts as well. The smolder and the Jin were kind of the high damage carries, if you will this game. Uh, Poppy was the one facilitating them, and we'll get to the Bard in a second, which I also thought was really good here from Delight, but um, the Smolder and the Jin were very positive overall for HLE. I really like Smolder in a matchup like this because T1 is one of those teams that relies on kind of going into the mid to late game neutral. They're not necessarily the most dominant team in the early game. More on that later, um, but I do think that like Smolder just kind of answers that well. As long as you can get Zekka into a good position, it's going to be fine. Like He's going to be useful in the late game as long as he has his stacks, and I love Jin. You guys know 
I think he's one of the strongest ADCs in the game, especially at neutralizing pressure. So overall, a really good like draft and a really good game from Hanwha Life Esports. I think that there were some things to clean up. You know, Doran was just generally fine on the top side of the map. I loved Delight's game. I, I didn't really mention him, but the Bard was really good as well. Um, and I do think I want to see them maybe be a bit more aggressive in the early game. Peanut was great at that in terms of mid-game pressure, but T1 really struggles at making early game decisions. That's always been their biggest weakness as this unit of five, and that's only been exacerbated over the course of this year. If HLE can really put the pressure on earlier on in games, then I think it's going to be even more dominating than it already was. So, you know, HLE winning in a, a T1 style game is never really a good sign for them, but for T1, uh, there are some things to be concerned about. I think it, this draft is really good in isolation. I want to make that clear. Things like Sejuani, I think, are very strong. I think even something like a Caitlyn mid can be very valuable in the current meta because there are just so many different options to play around the middle of the map. Something like Caitlyn does establish pressure early. It's one of the few things I think that actually can punish something like a Smolder early on if you do invest a lot of resources into it. And I think a lot of people forget that the Caitlyn bell curve is not this like, oh, strong in the early game, weak in the late game. She is very much like very strong in the early game, pretty weak in the mid game. And then once she gets to like three or four items, she is one of the strongest AD carries in the game. Once again, like her single target damage is just ridiculous. And so I understand the idea of picking Caitlyn mid. I generally think it's a pretty good idea. I just don't know if I like it for T1 because it requires so much proactivity from the middle of the map, and they just haven't done that over the course of this split. It's not really their game. It's the same thing with Ziggs. They don't really seem to understand how to play around Ziggs as a champion. They're so scared of playing into it because they're not very good at stopping a lot of the macro decisions that enemy teams make in the early game, but at the cost of them picking it, which is not great for them because it goes into a style that they're not comfortable with. Again, I just don't want to see this team trying to prioritize winning pre-10 minutes because that's not really what they do. They win in the 20 minute mark. Like that's where they are the strongest. That's T1 time. It's always been T1 time. And so to continue to prioritize the part of the game that I think you are weaker in, it's just really not ideal. Even if, again, in isolation, I really like these ideas. I like that they're going for something that can be more proactive. I just don't think this is maybe the direction to do it. Caria is going to get my debt of the game. I don't really know what was going on this game from Caria. He was making some absolutely bonkers decisions. This guy's a very good bard player. He should know better than to just AFK, you know, follow in the portal to his death. Like, that's just, it's very strange. Like, you would expect someone like Caria to not make those kinds of mistakes in these big moments because he's been on this stage so many times and, you know, in high pressure situations so many times, but he was making some pretty critical errors throughout this one that I just, I don't think are super repeatable. Guma is not good at Ziggs. Like, I just would not be picking this champion. They didn't look comfortable on it in the previous series. They don't look comfortable on it now. I think Ziggs is a strong champion and clearly they like don't know how to play against it, which is why they're so confident picking it early in these drafts, but I would just ban it. Like it is more valuable than a Vi ban in my opinion in a series like this. Uh, again, Caitlyn is really solid, but Faker's not the Caitlyn player on this team. Guma is the Caitlyn player. He's one of the best Caitlyns in the world. And so, you know, I think that you're really close with this draft. I think you're really close with these ideas, but there are just a couple of shuffling around like pieces moments that I think could really fix a lot of uh, the problems that ended up appearing in this game for T1, but they're only down 0-1. They end up winning this game number two. Everything is forgiven. It's all tied up at one apiece, and you go into a best of three. That's very winnable for both teams, and so pretty important game number two. However, if T1 fall down 0-2 to in this series, that is very dangerous. Having to win three games in a row against a team like HLE is really difficult. Certainly not impossible. We've seen that from T1 before, obviously, but it's not going to be the easiest thing in the entire world. You really want to win this game number two if you're T1, and if HLE Shelly can get that 2-0 lead. They're in a phenomenal spot heading into the back half of this series. So, very important game two. Only one team can take it. Who is it going to be? Well, the winner of game number two was... T1. They are going to take game number two. They're going to even up this series at one apiece. And this is the bounce back that we were kind of looking for. This was a good game from T1. I'm definitely not trying to take anything away from them. I think that there was definitely a world in which they lost this game. Shout out carry a bathroom buff. That was a very funny moment, I would say, towards the middle of the series that I just was not anticipating in the semifinals. But here we are. T1 comes back from the pause, and they are excellent. They clearly have a much better understanding of how to execute this comp in the back half of the game, which is ironic considering I don't think they drafted to do that. I think, 
Nidalee plus Tristana plus Ziggs, like, you should be able to get out to these gigantic leads in the early game and just try to snowball it. If this game goes 37 minutes and 51 seconds, typically speaking, I would not think that their comp would be better in that situation. Lucky for them, they had the GOAT in the mid lane. Faker is going to get player of the game here. This didn't really have to be thought about too much for me. This was a great game from him. I think that he played around uh, a lot of his teammates very well. Shout out Gumiyushi, who stole his Penta at the end of the game. Um, but Faker was excellent on the Trist in these team fights. He was the one who took over the final fight that ended up winning them the game. And so you got to give him a lot of credit. He continues to have one game or so every single series where he looks really good. And then every other one is just kind of along for the ride. I'm not trying to say that as a huge negative towards uh, Faker, but I would like to see at least a little bit more consistency from him, you know, in terms of, you know, him coming out and just dominating these games. I don't want to see these back and forth performances. I'd much rather see this kind of consistent game breaking, very strong team fighting on a game to game basis, but I'm glad it's happening at all. I just want to see it be a little bit more consistent. So we'll see what happens in future games, but it was there very much here in game two. Uh, Guma probably had his best Ziggs game. This is really the first game where T1 actively played around Ziggs in a way that I think was like strong for them. They were actively using him to take towers and create these big macro issues for HLE to solve in the early game. And who would have known the thing that was destroying T1, as long as they just play into that, it destroys other teams as well because T1's actually really good at the game. And so really shocking to see T1 actively go towards the thing that is going to help them a lot and have it work. So good for them. Guma was pretty good this game, even if he did steal the Penta here from Faker. Um, Carrie and Owner were fine, solid. Carrie was generally okay. I, I think Owner didn't really do all that much. Nidalee is just one of those champs where, you know, you either get the early game lead for your team, which they kind of did this game and, and then you fall off or you just fall off. Like there is no in between, like there's it, your usefulness is almost entirely at the beginning of the game. And then everything else is up to the rest of your team when it matters the most down the stretch. But dud of the game is actually going to stay on T1 side because Zeus tried his absolute best to lose this game for T1. Um, he played game two uh, Camille in the previous series against DK and looked phenomenal. Um, now we have game two Camille at home. This was was uh, really not a good showing here from Zeus. Again, we talked about it a bit. Camille has not been one of those champions that's performed particularly well or consistent at all over the course of the playoffs in any region. It's actually been kind of a bait pick. A lot of players have really struggled on this champ, really with the exception of that one Zeus game. We've not seen any good Camille games in any of the playoffs globally, and this was just another example of the champ really just needing to be in such a good spot in order to be useful because she is really squishy at the current moment. It is very easy to kind of shut down the Camille Luckily for T1, it didn't end up really mattering in the end. The Camille could be entirely useless and they would still win this 4v5 or 3v5 really without the Nidalee in these final games as well, which is a bit shocking to me. It does show a bit of a, uh, I guess, a player gap here between C1 and HLE, an objective gap and certainly a bit of a macro gap in this game. But you get, you're going to need better performances than this. HLE isn't going to gift you a victory like this again. And so, you know, as much as I like that T1 won this game, I'm certainly not sold that this is the end-all be-all for them. And then for HLE on the other side, you probably should have won this game. There's honestly not really a ton of excuses, in my opinion, for losing this. The Smolder was scaling, and all you had to do was give him the opportunity, and you weren't really able to do that. I thought that Zekka needed to be a lot more aggressive in this game on the Yone. There were a couple of really good plays and engages made from him, but uh, not nearly enough. I think you really need to start taking over this game and start being like the primary aggressor. Same thing for someone like Delight or even someone like Doran throughout a lot of this game. The moment that you turn off the switch and allow T1 to dictate the tempo, that's when it's dead, right? Like, you're, you're the scaling comp, and so when you get to that 30, 35 minute mark, even if you're down a ton of gold, that's when you start needing to be proactive. That's when you need to start playing as if your season's on the line, because that's just how this comp needs to operate. I like the idea here from HLE, but again, as we've seen very consistently, these teams that are opting into scaling, as opposed to trying to win early, they are just losing, not only here in the LCK, but everywhere. It's just not a consistent style that has been successful for a lot of different teams. And so HLE now falls down. Uh, I guess they tied up the series, but um, they are now down in momentum and in terms of pressure it's 1-1 we are just going into game number three, though. This essentially turns into a regular season best of three, and that's where HLE has really thrived over the course of this year. They're not out of it by any means, but T1, this is a very familiar story for them. They're fighting back. Maybe their first win doesn't look all that convincing. They lose game one. They barely win game two. But as we know from T1, this is probably the team that ramps up the most over long best of fives more than any other team in the world. It's been their specialty over the course of the time where these five have played together. And so I'm certainly not trying to count them out or saying that they're in a bad 
bad spot. I just need to see them be a little bit more clean than they were here in game number two. I would love to see maybe a draft that has more options, but again, indexing into early game, not really all that bad of a thing right now, so long as you can execute. But for HLE, if you can contest that early game just a tad bit more going into the mid to late game, then I think you're going to be in a better spot because if you had even a little bit more gold in this game, you probably end up winning it just purely off of draft alone. So overall, I still think that there is absolutely room for both of these teams to generate advantages, but only one team is going to be able to take the lead in this series. As you guys know, I think game three is the most important game of the entire series when you are tied up at one apiece. And so very important for both of these teams to win it. Who is going to take it? Well, the winner of game number three was... Hanwha Life Esports. They are going to take game number three. They're going to go back up in this series two to one and they have taken full control. This was a dominant and I mean dominant victory here. Poppy plus Smolder just feels unbeatable for T1. The Poppy cannot be let through this draft anymore. It creates so many opportunities. I know a lot of people are complaining about Smolder and that being the problem in games like this. Like Smolder is an issue and we'll get to it. Zekka was amazing and he's been playing great throughout this series. He's getting my player of the game because I do think he was the most influential player of this game three in particular, but Smolder becomes a lot less effective when you have a jungler that isn't quite as strong as what Peanut is on Poppy at the current moment. You just have to take him off of that champion. Clearly, that matchup on blue versus red side is not going to work out for T1, and, and we will definitely get more to it. Again, a pretty standard comp here from T1. Oh, I mean, except for maybe Zeri Top, which definitely is a little bit of a crazy R5. I don't think this is the time to be cooking if you're Zeus. I really think that, you know, this is not the situation where you should be pulling out something like a Zeri top. You already just ran it down on Camille, even in their victory. But again, we'll get to the more of that when we start talking about T1. Let's talk about HLE first and foremost. Like I said, Zekka is going to get my player of the game here on the Smolder. It's just really hard to look at anybody else as being more important, even if Peanut did a lot of the setting up and really like neutralized a lot of the Alistair, Corky, like Sejuani shenanigans, even the Ziggs like shenanigans that T1 ended up wanting to do. Um, I still think the Smolder was the most relevant champion in this game because the moment that he got online, the moment that he got those stacks and hit those breakpoints, the game was over. There was no way for T1 to be able to fight from that point onwards. I think it's funny that everybody goes back and forth on Smolder up until he has a game like this and all of a sudden it's like, oh, Smolder is the most broken thing in the entire universe, yada, 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 right? Like, we've seen so many games of Smolder just being along for the ride, but he has this kind of incredible game and now everybody wants to say he should get nuked from orbit. Like, I understand the idea. Smolder is very strong right now, and I'm certainly not against him getting a lot weaker. I don't really understand this idea that Smolder is unbeatable. I've seen that from a lot of people that this champion just shouldn't be let through draft. I think that there are absolutely ways to play around Smolder. I just don't think Corky is it. Like, I continue to believe that that kind of draft pattern isn't necessarily the most consistent way to beat something like Smolder, uh, especially if they're willing to draft it blind on B1. I think that there are a lot of ways to punish something like Smolder and Corky wasn't really the answer for me. I do think Sedge is generally a fine pick, but we'll talk about it. Owner is getting mega gapped right now in the jungle and a lot of that is just peanut playing out of his mind peanuts just such a good player he continues to be incredibly undervalued by the community as a whole i understand that oh there is this sentiment that he underperforms internationally i don't think a multiple time world semifinalist is quote unquote underperforming internationally i think that that is a pretty insane thing to say in my opinion expectations in league have always been a little bit too high for my taste but um, peanut continues to be one of the most dominant domestic lck players of all time and he's really cementing that here this guy always plays well into T1, specifically into owner. He is one of those players that just kind of has his number individually as a player, and don't give him Poppy. Like, this is his best champion. You cannot give him his best champion in such a pivotal, critical series right here for T1. You're down 2-1 because you've given him two games of Poppy. So, Peanut and Zekka taking over, I think, is great. I think Doran, Viper, and Delight all played really well in that same vein. Viper continues to be hyper-consistent and a great setup man out of the AD carry role, even if he doesn't need to be, like, the primary carry with all of the resources and all of the damage in the entire world. Delight continues to be great on Rakan. He's been better than Caria throughout this series, and Doran was definitely better than Zeus in this game and has been throughout a lot of this series as well. HLE just looks very good, and they're one game away now from not only qualifying for the LCK finals, but qualifying for Worlds, which is really big for them. And then 4T1 on the other side, things are just kind of going wrong. This is a bad matchup on paper, and it's looking worse and worse the more that you kind of look into the details. Um, Faker was horrible in this game on the Corky, but he's not quite dead of the game for me. It's going to go to owner in the jungle. This jungle gap has just been absolutely 
ginormous. Owner has not been able to keep up. Even on the Nidalee, it really didn't feel like he was making that big of an impact in the game down the stretch. It really was like Faker and Guma and even Caria to an extent that were just kind of separating themselves from HLE. Like, Owner has just not been good enough. Games 1 and 3, I'm not going to say we're solo lost by Owner or anything like that, but... They certainly weren't helped by owner's gameplay. That I will definitely say. You know, owner's never played particularly well into Peanut. It's always been a pretty bad matchup for him. And I've always been a bit lower on owner. I've very bit, I've been very vocal about how I'm not willing to put him in that elite tier of jungler. I think he's much more similar to someone like Shun over who's now benched on Billy Billy Gaming than he is to someone like Peanut in terms of his ability to like break through in the upper echelon. But even this, like this kind of performance, it's just not acceptable and you can't really expect this kind of stuff to continue and, and for this team to be fine. Like owner needs to step up if this team wants to be able to tie up this series. Faker has to obviously be better, but again, give him something that has a little bit more proactivity in the mid game. I say that, but like, I don't think there's a lot of options for that right now. I don't even really hate the Corky pick in isolation. I guess I think it's just much more about the general tone, the general vibe of what T1 is trying to go for. I think the longer these games go, like typically speaking, that's where I think T1 would be at their best, but I just don't think it's in their best interest to try to flip things with HLE right now. If you give them the opportunity to scale their players up, honestly, right now they are just better than you. And if you want to, you want if you want to beat a team that is better than you, what you have to do is attack them early and put them at such a wallet deficit that it doesn't matter that they can't outplay you in the back half of the game. So that has to be the strategy here for T1, and they just really aren't capitalizing on that at the moment. So a couple of things I think they could clean up, but they have to win this game number four. If they do not, they are of course eliminated. They are out of the playoffs and they will be sent to the regional qualifier to try and get that number three or that number four seed to go to Worlds. But for HLE, they are, they are now one game away from making their first ever finals. That would be massive for an org that honestly has tried over and over again to put together like pseudo super teams. This might be the best of all of them and they might be reaping the rewards right now if they can win this game for T1, of course, though. So not an easy out in elimination games. They ramp up over the course of these series. And so if they end up winning this game number four, if they can push this to a silver scrapes game number five, you certainly cannot count them out in a place where they are probably a lot more comfortable than HLE. So we'll see what ends up happening. But the only way to know is to go over game four. So let's get into it. The winner of game number four was... Hanwha Life Esports. They are going to take game number four. They are going to take this series three to one, and they have officially punched their ticket to the LCK finals. They have punched their ticket to Worlds as well, but this accomplishment, this achievement for this organization cannot be understated. They have tried and tried and tried to get here, to reach the mountaintop in the LCK, and they have finally gotten here. This is kind of the remnants of a Rox Tigers organization that was so beloved in the LCK. They obviously lose their spot, get bought out essentially by HLE, and you know, the remnants of that roster still live today with Peanut being able to drag them to that LCK. CK Finals. Drag is probably too harsh of a word. It's not like the rest of this team was bad at all, but player of the game and player of the series here is very, very easily going to go to Peanut in the jungle. There's just nothing to say. This guy absolutely gapped owner. He absolutely gapped all of T1 in this series, and this is just classic Peanut. If there is ever a team that has just not been able to beat Peanut, it is T1. It is crazy just how consistently he performs at his best when he goes up against his former team and his former, you know, teammates in players like faker so it's just really awesome to see I'm really happy for peanut that hopefully he can like really start getting some of that recognition I feel like it's so weird to say that so late into somebody's career but like again I want to reiterate there is like an argument that he is a top five player of all time I'm not sure I'm making that argument but there is some argument to be listed there that he is like the second best jungler ever behind Canyon and you know maybe maybe even the best like I don't know this guy's so many LCK titles it's genuinely ridiculous he's been so consistent over the course of his career and this is just another example that you cannot take Peanut lightly. He is going to obliterate you. It might not be the flashiest game of all time. He might not be the most, like, high-octane, you know, highlight-worthy kind of player in the history of the game, but you want somebody that can win consistently? Peanut is that guy. He is just the most consistent jungler you could ever ask for, and you're really excited for that. I know people have questions about his international performances. You know, he'll get a chance to prove that wrong again this year, but 
This guy's ridiculous. I mean, dominating the LCK domestically, that is enough for me to consider you one of the greatest of all time. This league is not easy. T1 is not an easy opponent, and yet Peanut continues to conquer them over and over again. Zekka also had another great series. People are talking about the Smolder, and I understand, like, three games of Smolder, three wins here for HLE, four games of Smolder technically, but Viper played it in game number two when they lost. Um, I get that people are complaining that Smolder is really overtuned, but let's not forget that Zekka did this exact same thing to T1 in round two on Yona. And so this isn't so much a smolder thing in my brain as it is just Zekka being really good and Zekka playing really well into Faker, who's just not really been all that good as of late. Like he's had his ups and downs for sure. But, you know, as much as I want to sit here and say that, oh, it's all the champions, Zekka has clearly shown that he is capable and willing to gap T1 on, on multiple different champions. So just another great series for Zekka where he just rarely ever dies. He has become the model of consistency somehow in the mid lane here for this team. It's basically the opposite of what he was in 2022 for DRX, but it's really working out for this team at the current moment. Um, Doran was really good in this series. Zeus got mega gapped on the top side. That's not a big surprise. Doran has always played really well into Zeus and Viper and Delight were pretty good as well. But this was a mid-jungle diff, um, certainly. Support was also a bit of a gap, but that had more to do with Carrier than it did with Delight, in my opinion. Peanut was unbelievable, phenomenal. Owner had no chance of catching up. Zekka was also kind of the main carry in this series. And that's everything that you could have wanted to hear about HLE. This team is now going to finals. They've qualified for Worlds. They've done everything everything that they wanted to do. Only one series remains, and honestly, can't count them out of that. But for T1, this is unfortunately the end of the road for their playoff run. Losing this means that they are now down into the regional qualifiers. That might not be the worst thing in the world for this team. Getting some more games under their belt might be a good thing, just getting more uh, practice and experience. That feels weird for a team that's been together for three full years at this point, but something is clearly wrong in terms of their meta read and in terms of their individual performances at the current moment. You know, dead of the game could go to either owner or Caria. Both of them got mega gapped here in game number four. I'm going to give it to Caria because he genuinely just was really bad in this series, but owner was really bad as well. Those two players, I'm not going to say single-handedly lost he won the series because I don't think that that's necessarily accurate or fair. Um, I will say, though, that it became a lot harder when Caria was playing so poor, when owner was playing so poor. Those are two players that you just can't really get away with not being good in a series like this. Guma, I think, really struggled throughout a lot of this trying to capitalize on Ziggs. That's four straight games of Gumiyushi Ziggs. Again, T1 just don't really know how to play around this champion, even if Guma is generally getting better at it. You know, Faker was fine on the Tristana, but certainly not nearly as good as Zekka on the other side. He made a couple of really big positioning mistakes that ended up costing him, and Zeus just keeps trying to be Mirwin in the top lane, picking things like Corky and Zeri and a lot of these AD carries. It's just not working out. He doesn't have the prio or the pressure or really the mechanical skill to beat someone like Doran in those matchups, and so it ends up honestly being more of a negative than a positive because you don't have that fallback of being some Something like a Cassante or a Renekton or, or an Orn or whatever that can just be relevant no matter what later on in the game. You're quirky and you don't have damage. And so that's a bit of a problem in a lot of these circumstances. But overall, T1 definitely were the worst of these two teams. And I think this really solidifies where they are coming into the World Championships. This is not a team that is currently a big favorite. I get that they won the Esports World Cup. I get that they did pretty well at MSI as well. And honestly, there is still a world in which, oh, T1 Worlds, like it just all figures itself out. They go on and win World Finals finals once again. Like, that's certainly not out of the realm of possibility, uh, but they have to qualify there first. They're going down to the regional qualifiers now. They'll obviously take on DK. We'll talk about that at the end of the video, but once again, congratulations to Hanwha Life Esports. Qualifying for World is obviously great, but doing it as one of the top two seeds in the LCK is incredibly impressive. I think that there is a very strong argument that this is very clearly a top three team in the world right now. I think it's really between them and like, I don't know, top esports like in terms of that. Maybe Weibo Gaming if you like really believe in them. Like there aren't a lot of teams that I think are competing for top three that are even half as good as HLE right now. It's been a lot of fun to watch and this team has really come together. There are a lot of players on this team that are very easy to root for that have had success in the past but have never really kind of escaped the shadow of some of the achievements that they've either had or had not had in players like Peanut and Doran's case and so I'm really excited to see what they can do moving forward. Their year is not done either domestically because they now move on to the finals. We'll preview that in just a second, but you know, Genji is a monumental challenge. They are the raid boss at the end of the game, and it's going to be a pretty big uphill climb to think that they could even try to compete with them, but hopefully they can make it interesting, at least more interesting than maybe winner's finals was. I think they're in good form right now, and obviously this team, you know, has a lot of players that are known for winning championships here in the LCK. Anything can really happen. Um, I'm not necessarily predicting that, but at the very least, top two is, I think, absolutely. Absolutely what this team was shooting for. 
All right, but that is going to do it for my LCK semifinals overview and analysis video. We are down to our final two teams. It's Genji, it's Hanwha Life Esports. You can see it up on the screen with the updated bracket. One of them will be your 2024 LCK Summer Split Champion. The other one will be going to Worlds as the number two seed to represent the LCK. Of course, both of them guaranteed those top two seeds because of championship points. HLE is now tied with championship points with T1, but of course, Summer is the tiebreaker, so they are guaranteed that number two seed even if they lose. And the number one seed, it goes to whoever wins this series. It's an automatic qualification for the summer split champion regardless of championship points. So uh, whoever wins this goes as one, whoever loses this goes as two. As I talked about, Genji are massive favorites in this series for a reason. Not because HLE is bad. Again, I want to reiterate, I really believe that they are very clearly a top three team in the world at the current moment. It just doesn't really matter. Genji is like number one and they're number one by a lot. They're in a tier of their own at the top of those rankings, and it makes it very difficult to try to predict anyone to ever be on their level. As good as Hanwha Life is, Genji is truly that raid boss at the end of the game. There really is not a lot of hope facing them. Now, if something were to go wrong for Genji, if they were to play under their own expectations, or maybe that finals buff that Doran and Peanut get uh, maybe carries over here to HLE, and perhaps they can pull off a miracle against their former org, but I'm just not really anticipating that. I would expect Genji to continue to take care of business, continue to dominate the LCK, and, and both of them to be in at least expected for going into Worlds, but let me know if you agree or disagree with that down in the comments section below. Would love to know your thoughts and opinions on that. Let's quickly take a look at our regional qualifiers because we do have that solidified now. As you can see, all four teams are locked in. This is the same format as the regional qualifiers in the LPL, if you were familiar with that, which means that the three and the four seed face off. The winner of that goes as the number three seed to Worlds, and then five and six play against each other to play the loser of that other series to see who goes as the number four seed to Worlds. And so one of T1 or DK will be the number three seed heading to the World Championships. T1 are going to be pretty favorited in that. I think that there are a lot of people that are looking at that as pretty easy prediction, but overall, I'm not going to do a ton of predictions right now for the regional finals. We'll talk about that a bit more after the LCK finals are over. We've got quite a bit of time. It's next weekend that that tournament even happens, and so quite a bit of time in between there to talk and predict about how this tournament will go, but these are the four teams that will be competing for the final two spots to go to Worlds. Very interesting stuff, but that's going to do it. I do hope you guys enjoy. If you did, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. Let's me know you guys are enjoying the content. And it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We, of course, don't only cover the LCK, but we will be covering the LCK finals in the next couple of days. We are covering the LCS as well. Finals are happening today. We'll be covering that in the next couple of days. Um, NACL finals are happening. And of course, we've got the regional qualifier here in the LCK. We've got so much world's coverage coming up. There is a lot of fun content. So if you're interested in a comprehensive overview, of everything going on in LOL Esports, this is the place for it. Hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos do go live. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day and I will see you all later.